Good morrow, fellow humans. My name is Sean and I am obsessed with infinity. So join me as I attempt to unpick the infinity of what is. I'm sure we've all seen that same video where the camera pulls away from the erupting surface of a yellowy orange star tracking up and out as planets whiz past like telegraph poles on through a flash of asteroids before a rainbow of planetary giants launch themselves into the distance as if hit for six by God himself until finally the imagery catapults us through a rain of neighbouring stars out into a bird's eye view of a galactic spiral that lay strewn against an endless smattering of sparkling cosmic fidgets. It's the sort of sequence one becomes accustomed to when indulging in a steady diet of pop science videos. But as big and beautiful as these high-res renders can be, they can actually harbour a hidden injustice especially when considering that they offer next to zero factual information. The relative scale of planets and their shared distances all tend to be judged purely by the artist's eye. Not to mention that for such a sequence to be captured on film, the camera would have been travelling at many times the speed of light, which, you know, might make the task of capturing such imagery well, just a, a tad difficult. But nowadays, we're all reasonably happy to forgive a certain amount of poetic license, accustomed as we are to the impossibilities given in the name of entertainment. But the troubling aspect of these sequences is not so much found in their wild inaccuracies, more in a subtle act of desensitisation that quietly denies us the most vital element of having these big ideas. What we have been robbed of is the emotion attained when imagining the unimaginable. Subdued, we have collectively forgotten how one should dance with infinities that lay drenched in the giddy head rush of vertigo, and tend now to absorb them in a numbed, almost matter-of-fact fashion, skipping them past our mind's eye as quickly as any technicolored 3D galactic roller coaster. So, when visualising the various ideas in this series, I'm again going to make the humble request that you take that little extra moment to sit with a thought, because whenever we as individuals do so choose to take on that added moment of attentive visualisation and reflection, what we find is that waiting for us just below the surface is the distinct quality of being pushed beyond the boundaries of our comprehension. So let's see how far we can go. Let's just see how long each of us can hold out in our attempt at coercing this mind-boggling perspective into our modest movies of the mind. Are we ready? Firstly, imagine that you could take your car and drive it in a straight line at 100 kilometers per hour without stopping, ongoing and uninterrupted, conquering the full equator of the earth as you round back upon where you first began. At this speed, it would take you just on 17 days to complete the entire round trip. But don't stop there. Keep building the image in your mind. Imagine sitting there Monday to Sunday, day and night, twice over, and half again, the world passing beneath your feet at the speed of the average motor freeway. This two and a half week long journey, this, this, is the size of our precious blue-green dot. It's not so easy to do, is it? But trudge on we must. So now, sitting high above our car, 
towing a line between falling in and falling away, we find ourselves inside the International Space Station, no longer passing over a minuscule 100 kilometres for every hour, but in free fall, travelling over 7 kilometres every second, passing over the same 100 kilometres in less than 15 seconds. We're now moving so fast that it takes us a mere 93 minutes to complete our first orbit, lapping our non-stop driver more than 260 times before reaching their journey's end. But why stop here? Why not travel as fast as universally possible, surfing a crest of an invisible electromagnetic wave, traversing the open regions of space at speeds, reaching towards 299,792 kilometers per second, the speed of light. As we build towards these speeds, we now begin to lap the Earth's equatorial loop seven and a half times every single second. Count them. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. It's about one and a half laps of the Earth for each syllable of the word Mississippi. Now, whilst trying to hold this image in our mind's eye, let's continue to widen the scope, aiming now for a point upon the horizon approximately 32 Earths away, and a massive 160 day night stay over in our non-stop car. A convoy which, if we began it in the early days of the new year, it would only come to its end sometime in the first week of June. So picture that, sitting in your car with the earth slowly retreating in your rearview mirror for more than five enduring months, time enough for the isolation madness to start kicking in, and all the while as you make your way across that one large step, the spherical beacon of the moon looms ever larger against the star-pitted sky. But what if we again shift our perspective in the hope that we might be able to hold on to the mental image just that little bit longer? Now I want you to visualise the enormity of the Earth and Moon's affinity by witnessing it from a bird's eye perspective, where the Earth now appears relative to our vantage point as equal to the size of an ordinary grape, and the Moon, now the size of a pea, circles that Earth once every month at the relative distance of 40 centimetres or 16 inches or whilst an indiscernible microscopic car travels slowly across the void, completing one centimetre every four days. So don't be fooled. Just to say that this is a really long way is a fairly seismic understatement. But as large as it is, when riding upon our wave of light, this once seemingly endless stay in confinement now has the ability to spark in and out of existence in a mere moment, crossing the entire chasm in a brief 1.28 seconds. That's the Earth to the Moon in one Mississippi, two. All good so far? All right, let's keep driving. From here on, if our cabin-fevered travellers were determined enough to try and make it as far as the sun, they would at some point be forced to participate in the obligatory passing down of the journey's torch, as well as the passing on of genes, as the wastelands of this vast desert crossing would offer very little respite within two, three, most likely four generations. Arriving at its final destination, not before seeing out a lengthy 177 years. So up to you whether you wish to play that little video in your head or not. From the vantage of our bird's eye view, we can now imagine this nearly two century long trek as being the equivalent distance of one and a half football fields in length, separating the sun from our fragile grape pea duo. A clearly ludicrous distance already, but when riding upon the universal speed limit, our indelible light wave has the ability to close this gap in a meagre 8 minutes and 12 seconds, which if you're happy just to sit out the next 8-ish minutes, I think you would have little trouble in appreciating the immensity of this abyss. 
a distance that's referred to as one astronomical unit, or AU for short. From the Sun, Jupiter is over five times this distance, at 5.2 AU away, and Neptune is a whopping 30 AU away, the equivalent of a 5,320 year long drive. But of course, the Sun's influence doesn't stop at the outer planets. So far as we can see, the influence is still present between 100 and 200,000 AU past the edge of a cloud of water ice particles that we call the Oort cloud. It's a place so distant that even our coma of light waves won't arrive before a tedious three year journey. So what does this mean for our generations of backpacking road trippers? Well, for them, this means that if we were to drive this distance uninterrupted, day and night at our strict 100 kilometers per hour, they would have needed to have left the Earth sometime during the Eocene Epoch, approximately 35 million years ago, when our ancestors had yet to even leave the safety of the trees. So welcome to our tiny little solar system, a few specks upon a dot. Our nearest celestial neighbour, Proxima Centauri, it's not too much further on, just a mere 1.24 light years further than that previous three light year marker of the sun's influence. This taking our total year's driving figure up to a casual 49,100,000 years, just peanuts really. But as you can see, we're now getting into those numbers which, due to their immensity, simply become too abstract for the mind to fathom. So let's ditch the car at the side of the old space road and get back to our good old grain of sand analogy. Now if the Earth was no longer a grape, but the size of a grain of sand, the Sun would be about the size of a beach ball, taking approximately 1.3 million Earths to fill the Sun. So are we having fun yet? Okay, so let's now take the Sun and make it the size of a grain of sand. At this scale, Proxima Centauri is now 1,572 kilometres away, the equivalent of driving direct from Melbourne to Brisbane. So that's one grain of sand, sipping coffee under the grey skies of Melbourne, whilst another soaks in the sun on the beaches of Brisbane with absolutely nothing in between. So sorry about that, New South Wales. And the Milky Way galaxy? The galaxy which contains our Sun, Proxima Centauri and another 100 to 400 billion stars? This majestic vortex of light is at this scale approximately 60% the size of the actual Sun. And still the story grows. Because if we were to imagine the entire Milky Way galaxy as being the size of a single grain of sand itself, then the entire observable universe would be approximately one kilometre cubed, side to side, top to bottom, and it would contain at least two trillion grains of sand, each a galaxy and each containing more stars and planets than there are grains of sand on all the beaches in all the world. Imagine shooting two trillion grains of sand into the sky across a one by one kilometre cube and then taking a snapshot. This is the universe as we see it, all floating carelessly above a cheery 10 or so minute walk. So, have you given up yet? And is that even it? Currently, we understand the universe to be around 13.8 billion years old. And so, an obvious upshot is that there can't be any starlight that predates this age of the universe. And so it's this very fact that reveals to us why even the observable universe's previously declared 93 billion light year diameter is still not the end. Simply because anything that we can describe as being observable from our vantage point in space must reside within a 13.8 billion year old light horizon. Now this is a fairly well-known and 
relatively easy concept to understand, so we'll just do a quick refresher. Due to the finite speed of light, the further away a light source is, the longer it must have taken for its light to reach us. And so the further abroad we look, the older the light. And so when we begin to identify starlight, whose age is now approaching the age of the universe, what we're seeing is the actual light that was emitted at the birth of starlight. This was a mere 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And so this boundary to our line of sight, what we call the observable universe, doesn't in any way suggest that space or time ends on these horizons. As it is with any horizon, such as one seen in a boat surrounded by water, as we move, our horizon will move with us. However, it is nonetheless upon this illusory boundary where we do reach the edge of our confirmed knowledge and the first of many such shorelines of understanding. A description of the universe past this boundary is one that we're at least fairly sure exists, but in what forms or how much further the universe expands in its current state is a question still in hot debate. Some experts estimate a mere 250 times the size of the observable universe, where others suggest that the universe might be truly infinite. Then there are highly supported theories which step outside of our pool of space and time entirely, suggesting the existence of higher dimensions or even multiverses. And perhaps these ideas are more than just wishful thinking. As the mathematical evidence for such theories is so very impressive that many of our top thinkers, those who tackle these issues daily, hold these ideas in very considerable favour. But either way, what we do seem to be sure about is that our pocket of space-time, it's expanding. And what's more, the expansion is getting faster. But the question that intrigues me is, what, where or when is the universe expanding into? Many say that it's not, in fact, expanding into anything because the universe is everything. But as far as I'm concerned, this can be interpreted in two different ways. As it might suggest that the universe as we know it continues infinitely, or that beyond its finite nature exists a true nothingness, which in its own way would exist in an infinite state. But here is where we now have the freedom to dip that first toe into the unknown and to start considering what this idea of infinite expansion might mean for us, the infinitesimal speck upon a speck. Because from our vantage point, we do appear to exist within a vast, endless, ever-expanding and almost totally empty universe. It's utterly empty. In fact, the observable universe is so devoid of matter that if we were to collect all matter residing within it and brought it into a single place, it would only fill a cube 1,000 light years side to side. Now that's a mere 0.0000000000000000042% of the known universe. So how are we supposed to feel about such a relationship between the infinite void and an infinitesimal eye that sits at our centre? Often, and quite understandably, this image of the universe can leave us feeling, well, small, insignificant and devoid of meaning, even just blatantly scared. But what must always be remembered is that if reality is indeed infinite, then any representation of scale will only ever be one of a mere finite perspective. For in contrast to these unfathomably large scales, the perspective at the alternate end of scale will show us how we will always be as comparatively grandiose to it as the outer universe is to us. The physicist Richard Feynman once put forward the question, quote, 
If in some cataclysm all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? Feynman's own answer was that it would be the atomic hypothesis, that all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they're a little distance apart, but repelling upon being squeezed into one another. In that one sentence, you will see that there is an enormous amount of information about the world, if just a little imagination and thinking are applied. End quote. So in that vein, take a look at your fingertip. Now, imagine that your fingertip is the size of the room that you're sitting in. Fill the room from floor to ceiling with rice. Each grain of rice is now the approximate size of one of your cells. Now enlarge just one of these cells, these grains of rice, to the size of your room again, and then fill it with rice. Each new grain is now relative to the size of a molecule. And each molecule is now so small that it surpasses the length of visible light waves, and so can't be seen using traditional light-based microscopes. Okay, so far, so good. Now I want you to fill the spaces in between the rice grains with fine grains of sand. This, my friends, is roughly the size of an atom. Another way to picture this is that if we were to increase the size of our atom to the size of the grain of sand, then an equivalent increase in the sand grain would leave it towering at heights more than three and a half times out of the Eiffel Tower. Indeed, they're so tiny that our bodies are roughly made of seven octillion of them. So many that if we were to take a human body's worth of atoms and string them up in a line side by side, they would reach from the Earth to Proxima Centauri and back again four times over. Now we're going to have to return to the atomic realm a few times yet, so it's probably best that we grasp just a basic understanding of what an atom is. Using the metaphor first put forward by physicist Ernest Rutherford, I want you to now take this atom and blow it up to the size of a grand cathedral. In the middle of this cathedral-sized atom is its nucleus, now the size of a solitary fly, right in the centre of the hall, buzzing away one fly. And it is this tiniest of pests which is responsible for 99.9% .9 of the atom's total mass. Whilst bouncing between the various tapestries and stained glass windows are the electrons flying in and around, sort of, what is essentially empty space. Again, sort of. But that can't be right, can it? After all, this would suggest that all elements in this already empty universe, and thus all things, are they themselves 99.9999999999996% empty space. So is all reality merely the slightest haze of an almost non-existent vibrating cloud? If you find yourself balking at this peculiar suggestion, then you may find some comfort in the knowledge that most physicists would be equally uncomfortable with such an artless use of the word empty. For as we shall later uncover, the true nature of empty space, in spite of what many think, is as intriguing as it is complex. Though it still seems that even with a deeper understanding of this emptiness, we're unlikely to ever free ourselves from any amount of peculiarity. What it does mean, though, is that this empty interpretation of both the universe and the atom should only be considered as partially true, a perspective which becomes relevant only in the precise moment when we take our measurement of the subatomic particle. So let's take a look at these subatomic particles. What about the electrons? If the nucleus can be appreciated as being the equivalent size of a fly in a cathedral, how big's the electron? Is it smaller again? Well, yes, much smaller, 
sometimes and sort of. When we refer to such particles, we often make the mistake of thinking about them as tiny floating billiard balls. Though what this would then suggest is that these particles should have a definite location in both space and time, just as a billiard ball does upon a billiard table. Though our current understanding of matter tells us a very different story, stating that matter must not only be thought of as having these particle-like properties, but also as having wave-like properties. This is, of course, quite peculiar, as the nature of a wave is something quite different to the nature of a particle, in that it must exist, not as a finite block filling a single unit of space or time, but as a movement, a permeation through a medium, evolving its position in both space and time. Unlike the nature of being, which we associate with particles and objects, a wave is, in contrast, a type of happening. If we were to constrain this wave to a solitary moment in time, it may be assumed that its nature was point-like and non-spatial, but when unfolding through time, its true spread-out nature is revealed. So, due to this wave-like nature of matter, we tend to get a few curious interpretations about what an electron actually is, and even more peculiar, what it's actually doing. For up until the moment, when we take the measurement of the electron's speed or location, that suggested empty space, which initially filled the cathedral, instead now starts to behave much more like a liquid, as if it was filled with a waving cloud of some sort. This being the wave function of the electron. But the electron hasn't become a wave as you might imagine, as this wave is instead a wave function of probability. And it is the electron's potential location that somehow fills the empty space. And it is the potential location which gives the atom its unique shape, specific to its count of particles and its level of complexity. As things can get a little bit head scratchy with these topics, I'm going to attempt to illuminate them in much greater detail across later episodes. But just for now, in regards to our descent of scale, we'll continue to focus on the particle-like nature of the electron for when we do choose to measure its position, it does, as one would hope, and appears in a single spot just as any respectable particle should. The only issue is that it doesn't tend to make things any simpler. For it's a particle so small that not only is it incapable of ever being divided, but it can't even be said that it's taking up any space at all. It's what physicists like to call a point-like particle. In other words, the size of the electron is comically somewhere between the size of the entire atom and practically non-existent. So, there you go. I hope that was helpful. Point-like particles are the smallest things we have ever discovered, believed to host no spatial dimension at all. But though they seem lacking in this spatial dimension, they do host some portion of mass as well as a certain magnetic influence called spin, which extends into their environment. And electrons also have the ability to both emit and absorb the massless photons that we experience as light. All of which seems to evoke a curious question regarding the division between a particle's state of being and its state of influence. But let's not get sidetracked with that conundrum just yet. For now, as they are considered to host no internal structure, they are referred to as non-spatial, and it's in this sense that they're often suggested to sit upon some sort of space-time bedrock, in that they're called fundamental, as if they were the ground floor of matter. So what about that fly in the centre of the atom? What do we know about its innards? Inside the nucleus are the protons and the neutrons, and inside the protons and neutrons are the quarks, a simple trio made of two up quarks and a down quark for every proton, and two down quarks with one up quark for every neutron. Two unique particles which remarkably, like the electrons, are not considered to have any spatial dimension at all. Never have we ever discovered anything smaller than these three particles. And as such, the up quark, the down quark and the electrons 
are considered to be the fundamental building blocks of all matter. Practically everything that is, is so because of the relationships of these three, and only three, non-sized particles. I have to say, this question, how, really seems to be paying off. Okay, but that's matter. Can it be said that anything lies beneath matter? The issue is that at this size, concepts of shape, size and things need to be re-evaluated. Because in the same way that we once passed the scale of light waves, we have now also passed the scale of matter waves and thus of things. But there is still, however, a perspective of reality which does pave the way for the particle. Indeed, with a greater understanding of this realm, we shall come to realise that the notion of these particles has been illusory all along. But what could be smaller than non-spatial, you ask? The funny thing is, the perspective from which we can suggest that these particles sit upon something doesn't offer us up a description of something smaller. In contrast, the realm which is said to underlie that of the particles is one that permeates the entire universe. These are what physicists refer to as fields. Invisible fields of force which are everywhere, in every moment, not only interacting with particles, but giving rise to them. And it is these fields that also give empty space its intriguing and complex nature, something which we will invest our time into across the coming episodes. However, beyond this scale, at the extremity of the deep dive where concepts relating to both space and time cease to be relevant, we reach the mysterious and all-important Planck length and the theoretical realm of quantum foam. Now remember that this is a perspective of reality that surrounds and penetrates us at every moment and exists at the smaller scale of your own body and is in existence across the entirety of the universe right now. So how big is the Planck length? Well, it's visualizing time again. The human eye can see about one-tenth of a millimetre, or the average width of a human hair. Now enlarge this hair to the size of the entire observable universe. An atom is now one light year across, and the Planck length is now one-tenth of a millimetre, the width of a human hair. So now stop, and just take that moment for yourself again. The universe that we mere apes have thus far uncovered simply by asking the question how time and time again has now been revealed to us as being as big as the observable universe is to a human hair as a human hair is to the Planck length. Clearly it's impossible to fully visualise this picture of the universe as a whole, but it's definitely fun to try boundless large meeting the boundless small as viewed from the vantage point of our species a species who have only within the last 50 years been able to reach their own moon and I promise you it is worth it to just take that moment and to sit with the thought because it's here that we again find another shoreline in our understanding here at a scale so small that space-time becomes impossible to measure, not only physically but theoretically, where the numbers simply fall away into infinity, creating what is essentially a mathematical dead end. Why? Well, because we simply don't have the necessary language required to ask the next right question. Unfortunately, our most successful and prevailing language to date, the digital language of mathematics, simply cannot tolerate the analog nature expressed by such infinities. And thus, we're left stranded and confused, desperately wishing away these infinities as we attempt to interpret the riddles embedded within the equations. So what might be a satisfactory interpretation of this mathematical boundary? If these extents are not an edge of reality, 
could they perhaps be suggesting an edge to space-time? Well, that isn't something that we can claim just yet, but there are a few mathematical theories which are suggesting that gravity, and hence the field of space-time, might be quantized at this scale, and that the relevance of the Planck length is exactly this transition from ordinary space-time into a world where the fabric is so fine and distorted that ordinary concepts such as up, down, here, there, now and then become irrelevant. But it is, for now at least, the very edge of our current agreed understanding. So let's dive in. Beyond this shoreline and take a brief moment to consider the nature of infinity and how it might start to influence our own philosophies of reality. If in this first thought experiment, we were to apply the infinity equation to this idea of scale, there may now be a potential for us to consider a perspective where any measurement of size or scale would not be a reflection of deep reality, but instead only a construct of a conscious mind. <laughs> okay, now I know that was a leap. Perhaps I should elaborate. Firstly, just consider what we now know about the universe thus far described. The first thing I notice is that the boundaries which we use to define any one material object over another will at a certain level of perception simply cease to exist. There seems to be no ultimate walls present anywhere within nature, regardless of how many times we double or dissect our vantage point in search of them. From our mixed vantages of perspective, which to date have included a blend of microscopic, macroscopic and astronomical perspectives, it becomes clear that any apparent whole, whether it be a rock, a person, a planet, a star or a galaxy, can always be recognised as both a sum of its constituent parts whilst equally participating as part of an ever grander whole. Each thing bleeds into the next. Now imagine instead a universe bereft of consciousness. A rock would no longer have the prejudice of identifying as just the rock over say its identity of the constituent parts or its grander whole, or even the spaces in between. It is and always has been the one thing. However, we, through the limitations set by our conscious perspective, recognise the rock as being solely a rock, simply because we have an evolved ability to translate electrical interactions occurring at the microscopic level into an experience of touch, when the electromagnetic force of our atoms push up against the electromagnetic force of the rock's atoms, allowing us to sense a false boundary. Touch is an illusion. In actuality, we never sit on a chair. In reality, we only ever float slightly above it. Equally, an apparent boundary is sensed when light photons interact with the electrons of the rock, which then absorb certain frequencies whilst repulsing others sending electromagnetic waves off into the environment as little packets of light are then caught by the pupil of our eye converted into an electrical pulse then sent directly to the brain whereby it is then translated into the experience of sight but beyond the limitations of experience none of these boundaries actually exist reality without consciousness goes from being an infinity of finite raindrops being an infinite unified ocean. And in being an infinite ocean, no part of it can ever be considered as either small or big compared to the whole. There is of course a relative difference between two objects, observed within a restricted finite perspective, but beyond that perspective, any traits of finite individuality simply melt away. The point is that we need to acknowledge that any measurement made within our reality can only ever be considered a measurement relative to two individual finite perspectives that are otherwise made in and of the same unified whole. 
We shouldn't imagine this infinite expanse and miniaturization of the universe as a type of growing, with the expansion on the right and the miniaturization happening on the left. We instead imagine the infinite smallness to exist everywhere that the infinite largeness does. They're the exact same space, just viewed through different eyes.